one of the things I've learned about marathons is that that's my favorite moment is to look back at everybody else who's about to start behind us because it kind of gives you this sense of camaraderie that you're like all about to go into battle together, you know? So that's what I think about. Last year, I was thinking about how miserable I felt and like kind of panicking and I was super distracted on the starting line and I feel kind of sad about it because I didn't really get to have that moment. Um, I was just like, spiraling a little bit um, so this year I'm going to be really intentional about like taking it in I mean it's such a historic start line just to enjoy the moment welcome to for the long run the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long strong and motivated I'm your host Jonathan Levitt through personal and professional connections in the running world I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspects of running and what helps people to achieve success, however they define it. And this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. We're so excited to announce a new partnership with our friends over at Salt Stick Electrolytes. Salt Stick was founded by a PhD chemist who also just happened to be a professional runner and triathlete. Their products are specifically designed to mirror the electrolyte ratios that you lose in sweat. As many of you know, and I've talked about on this podcast, I'm a salty sweater. That's right, I said it again. I'll say it again, salty sweater. And I need hydration products that help me replenish my salt and all the other goodies that I lose in my sweat. So that's why I'm stoked to work with Salt Stick. Salt Stick has capsules, drink mix powders, and fast chews. Remember sweet tarts? Yeah, fast chews are like that, but for electrolytes. Fun and functional, and that's what we like to see. Head on over to Elite Nutrition to check them out and use code FTLR for 20% off your first order. By supporting Salt Stick, you're not only going to step up your hydration game, but you're also supporting the show. That's A-L-E-T-E nutrition.com and code FTLR. We are proud to share that this episode is sponsored by our friends over at Puma. Here at For the Long Run Podcast, we're fans of Puma and have been really impressed with their efforts to support and foster the running community. We're excited to partner with a brand that has such a rich history in sports and that cares deeply about the running community. Puma believes that sometimes all it takes is a spark to make a change, to get motivated, or to try something new or hard. And we couldn't agree more. All we need is that small spark and the actions will follow to get us there. With that small flicker, anything is possible. Puma Running Shoes offers supreme cushioning, superior propulsion, comfort, and lightweight technology. I've been running in the DV8 Nitro first mile, and I love how it has a focus on sustainability. The shoe feels amazing, and even better, it's in collaboration with First Mile. It's made from at least 20% recycled material, as First Mile's focus is on cutting down plastic waste in production and in the supply chain by finding innovative ways to get recycled plastic into products like Puma running shoes. Check out a pair for yourself at puma.com and use the code FORTHELONGRUN for 20% off any Puma run or train products. When you support Puma, you support me and the rest of the For The Long Run podcast team. Thanks again to Puma for sponsoring us. We are psyched to announce a new partner of the podcast, Lauren Daniels. Lauren is a realtor helping buyers and sellers in the greater Denver and Boulder area and beyond, and has been a good friend of mine for a few years now. When I decided I wanted to buy a place in Boulder and put down roots here, I was completely overwhelmed by the home buying process. Lauren was already a good friend, so when we first talked about home buying, I felt a huge sense of relief. She's a neighborhood expert, has an incredible attention to detail, available for any and all questions, and made what could be a very difficult process super easy. And now we've got a beautiful home in Boulder. It's close to the trails with the big backyard for Alfie and views of the Flatirons. So if you're even considering buying a home in the area or anywhere, I highly recommend working with Lauren. You can reach her at ldaniels at milehighmodern.com and let her know we sent you. That's ldaniels at milehighmodern.com. Thanks so much to Lauren for supporting the podcast and helping us continue to grow and for all those miles together. And we are back with Sarah Vaughn going round two on the podcast. We have similar dog noises, but a different setup. So you can you can watch this on video as well. But Sarah, thanks so much for taking some time to chat ahead of uh, Boston Marathon. Of course. I know it's your favorite time of year. So I'm excited <laughs> to feel some of your hype too. Yeah, I think I think it was a one hour hype session last year. Exactly. Um, 
So that was about 50 episodes ago. So okay. I'm sure there's some new listeners. So we'll go through the the whole the whole business. So who is who is Sarah? Uh, do you want, you want me to answer yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, better I'm, you than me. Yeah. Well, sometimes I like other people to hype <laughs> me up, though. You know. Um, so no, I'm a I'm a mom of four. Um, I'm married to my awesome husband Brent, who is also my coach, and I work full time as a realtor here in Boulder, and we've lived here since college. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm a runner too. I guess I didn't, I didn't put <laughs> that part in running. there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, you were saying you run 80 miles a week with your dog. So your dog dabbles in running as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I do more than that. And he, he sticks with me for about 80 miles. I don't take him on the workouts just cause I get a little nervous about, you know, if he were to ever like trip me up or something, but he could totally run a four minute mile, like no problem. Um, <laughs> could but, you? um that would be like, if I were like strapped to him and yeah, no, yeah, no probably not. But, um, he is my trustiest training partner. Nice. Yeah. You've been doing a lot of training with a lot of different people out here in Boulder over the last couple of years, huh? Yeah. This has been a bit of a lonely buildup to Boston. Um, my other training partner, also my husband and my coach, decided to like not really run anymore. So he's been in the weight room a bunch and not really pacing me as much. So it's been, yeah, pretty lonely buildup. Also, I've been on the treadmill a ton, so that can get kind of lonely. But I've made like a very concerted effort the last month to like meet up with different people around Boulder. So as your coach and your running partner, he decided not to run. How is that good coaching? Yeah, I mean, he's still an amazing coach. But, you know, the poor guy trained really hard for a lot of years. And I think he just maxed out on, on his, like he still loves running. He'll run a few miles with me a couple times a week, but he's not. Like, I mean, he trains so intensely for so long. He's just kind of wants to rest. Makes sense. Fair enough. Resting is training sometimes. Right. It's good to have balance. So um, we are looking out at a snowy boulder. Uh, It was, I don't know, 70 degrees on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And today is Tuesday. Um, It'll be 80 next week before we both set off to Boston. Talk to me about managing training in such... I mean, a lot of people come to Colorado because they're like, oh, the weather's perfect. 300 days of sunshine a year and yeah. the winters aren't bad. And this winter, compared to my experience in Boston, has been not bad. But compared to what right. people come to Colorado for, yeah. uh, perhaps less than ideal. So talk to me about um, this particularly challenging winter and using the treadmill a lot and, and how you've been able to um, stick with it. Yeah, it has been a particularly nasty winter. We've been here, I came here in 2005, so I've been here a long time. And this is probably the worst winter I remember as far as like snowfall and number of snowstorms and just like the necessity to go on the treadmill. And also I think from having babies and just past injuries, like I get some SI joint stuff when I run on the snow. So I just avoid it um, at all costs and invested in a nice treadmill a few years ago and have defaulted to that like way more than normal. But I think the thing that got me this winter and a lot of people that are from here are also saying this, it's the cloudiness and the grayness. Like we have not, that's not normal for Boulder. You know, the snow is one thing, but then the sun comes out, like you're saying more than 300 days of sun. And we just have like those three or four gloomy days in a row every couple of weeks have like, I'm, I'm a little susceptible to seasonal affective stuff. And I've just been like, I'm just going to go run on my treadmill and watch some Netflix. Like, it's just hard. So managing it, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job, honestly, because it's just been difficult. And luckily with marathon training, you can use the treadmill for most of it. Um, During like getting ready for a track season, it's a lot harder. So, you know, I'm just glad I have my treadmill and my Netflix. (laughs) Netflix and treadmill. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I feel that. It's been weird this winter where I guess last winter it was sunny. All It felt like it was sunny all the time. January had sunshine and mm-hmm. it was super cold in February for a week. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard when you're expecting to see the sun and you don't. And it's just interesting to hear how different people have made it through the winter and I would say we're on the other side, but it's actively snowing right now. I know. Now, I know. So. Well, and remember last year it snowed in May at the state track meet, the high school kids state track meet in the end of May. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're nowhere near like the end end of it. But normally we start getting 70 degree days in February. Yeah. It's a couple at a time and definitely in March, but here we are, April next week, hopefully. Well, it's going to be 80 next week. Yeah. So yeah. there we go. <laughs> um, so let's, let's rewind a few years to Sarah as the maybe amateur runner or getting into running. Yeah. Um, What got you excited initially about the sport? Like way back when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a kind of a fun like intro into um, into running story. Um, So I was a pretty serious gymnast up until my freshman year of high school. Like I would be going twice a day 
I was in the gym a lot of hours a week. And I was, I was growing up in a pretty small town and my gym, like literally just one day went out of business. <laughs> so it was like a Monday morning. It was like two weeks before my freshman year. And I, my mom had dropped me off or I walked over or rode my bike. I can't remember, but I Actually, I probably drove because I drove when I was 14 <laughs> in Nebraska. I had a farm <laughs> permit. So I drove myself to the gym, walk up, and there's like a padlock on the door and it's closed. It's just like no practice today. So I call my mom and I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm like, like, this is my life. This is what I do all the time. And I had hoped to do it in college. And my mom was like, well, I got an email from Coach Nash. He's the cross country and track coach. And I think she's like, I think they have practice in like 20 minutes <laughs> at the high school and you're dressed to work out. Why don't you just go to that? I was like, I guess, like, I'll just get in a workout today at least. Like, I won't waste the day. And I showed up to the first day of cross country practice with my leotard with shorts over and like a pair of JCPenney, you know, sneakers. And, you know, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> I um, went on a run with them. I remember, like, I had no idea really what I was doing. I'd never run or trained with people. We did like a four mile loop around our little town. And as soon as I recognized where we were on the way back, I like started sprinting because I thought that's what you do at the end of a run is you just like race people and be the first back. And Is that not what you're supposed to do? I guess not. I don't know how I had any friends in high school <laughs> on the cross country team because they're like, who is this girl? But they were, um, they were good sports about it. And uh, yeah, and I did that for like two weeks until my coach was finally like, you don't have to kick at the end of every run. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. So in two weeks, you're running your second Boston Marathon as a professional athlete. There's been a bunch of miles in between. Right. Talk to me about that journey. Yeah. Well, you know, in high school, the dream had to pivot pretty quickly from not being able to do gymnastics in college to figuring out some other thing. And I just got really lucky. I was really blessed that running also served me really well. Um, my freshman year, I, I did fine at the cross country state meet. I think I was seventh and then I won the mile that spring um, in track. And so that really opened my eyes up to a whole different Olympic sport. You know, I knew it was also a sport, but I didn't really know the ins and outs of it. And, um, you know, a couple of years later, I started getting recruited by some schools and found my way that way. And as far as like, you know, track and field, that was always super exciting to me. I, I've, I've loved the 1500 and the mile forever. And then like the marathon, I just sort of thought it was something that I would get into maybe like as a charity event after I was done <laughs> running track or, you know, like I kind of always took it as like a, I'm falling behind on the track or like my track days are behind me. So then I have the marathon to fall back on, but I'm glad I went to it earlier in my career than I had originally planned because now it just feels like act two. So yeah, um, like you said, lots of miles in between, lots of unsponsored years between college and now, but I've always loved it and it's always been there for me. So how come you've kept at it? Yeah, I think it's just been one of those things that has always like called me to keep coming back. I mean, there have been times in my career where it was really obvious to everyone around me that I should probably walk away from the sport. It just didn't make sense, like financially or, well, mostly financially, <laughs> you know, like it was a, it was a actual financial drain on our family for a while when I wasn't sponsored, especially in track when you're racing every other weekend. And it's just hard. It's just hard. But I, I kept getting a little better every year. You know, I never didn't PR in something from the 800 to the 5k. I would always find myself improving and just not only that, but I just had a longing to like keep going. So I've always kind of tried to think of it as something that like makes me better at the other parts of my life too. Um, but I like the competitiveness of it too. I love what you said about the makes you better at other parts of your life. Talk to me more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that like my kids will tell you like if I'm super grumpy on a given day, they're like, wow, mom hasn't gone out for her run yet. <laughs> you know, so it's like it's like a mental mental health break for me daily, even in the intense training um, phases. It's always like the time where it's just me and myself and I can push myself and nobody needs anything else from me for that 90 minutes. I just get to focus on myself. So yeah, selfishly, it's like this great piece of my day. A lot of people call running a selfish endeavor, but I think it's the opposite, right? For the reasons you just said, um, you're a better version of yourself. You're probably more grounded. You're mm -hmm. probably, you know, all these qualities that you like about yourself and right. that make you a happy person to be around. And so my my response to all these people is like, well, take, take all that stuff away 
And then what? Like you're a grumpy person with an extra 90 minutes a day. <laughs> exactly. What's the value in that? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it weren't running, I'd probably fill it with something else that gives you some sort of balance. But the fact that running, you know, my body loves running, my mind loves running, and it's just easy in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. I think it'll always be my thing. So you run two two marathons? Um, so this will be my fourth. Fourth. So CIM, Boston last year, right. Chicago. Right, right, right. So this will be number four. Um, so we we spoke last on the podcast prior to Boston 2022. Right. Um, it was the, the Boston Marathon, let's get everyone amped edition. Right, <laughs> right. Talked through yeah. the course and yeah. all the excitement and whatnot. So um, this, if you're listening to this episode on the day that it's released, the marathon is... In three days. Okay. So got it. Um, very exciting. What did you love about Boston last year? Man, I actually loved everything. <laughs> I really did. Retweet. Like, yeah. Like it was so it was so cool. I mean, having gone from CIM, which is like super laid back, casual, stroll up to the start line. Um, it's just like makes you feel like running's the center of the universe. Like you're just everything from the time you land to the time you leave, you're, you're taken care of and people are excited about running and you're running and they're running and it's just so cool. <laughs> I mean, the crowds, uh, all of it. I had such a poor day last year, but there was literally, I kid you not, at some point during the last mile where I was like, am I winning? Everybody's cheering so loud. Am you were I, by am yourself. I winning? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did everybody, did 20 people in front of me drop out? <laughs> like it was, they were going nuts. And I was like, I'm having an absolute miserable day, but these people were losing their minds. It was great. It was so cool. But that's the epitome of like, nobody cares, right? The, yeah. the Laura yeah. Green story. Yeah. Um, by the way, speaking of Laura Green, we'll be co-hosting a bunch of events Yay. around uh, the marathon with Puma Saturday and Sunday cool. of Marathon Weekend. But Laura's point is great. Nobody cares. Right. Like yeah. it's just yeah. running. It's just running. And it's so it's so funny to like have this conversation with professional athletes who are being paid to run or they're being paid to represent a brand and run fast and they're still able to to realize that it's this just like you can still you can have a terrible day and people can still love you for it. Right. Yeah. What what would you say to someone who's listening to this and they're like, "Oh, I'm I'm listening to this podcast because I'm running my first Boston on Monday." Mm-hmm. And I want to hear what Sarah has to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like my mind's eye, I, I don't trust it with uh, with how the course was because I was just so miserable um, the whole time. Like when I'm thinking back about it, the Newton Hills feel like mountains <laughs> and, you know, like it just, it felt so hard. So I don't know if I can give clear advice today, <laughs> um, but you think you're jaded. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit like, I can't wait to get that taste out of my mouth. Um, because the, I did love everything else about it other than, you know, the unfortunate day I had. So I think, you know, my best advice would be like everybody's advice. Don't get too caught up in the first half and just be ready. Like the race starts in those hills and you have to have your legs, even on the backside of those hills, um, you have to have your legs. And then definitely take a moment, whether you're in first or 20th or 2000th to take in the crowds that last stretch. Cause it's really cool. Yeah, I just got the chills. So um, I think the Newton Hills can be the fastest part of the course, but you have to get there in good shape. And that's yeah. like really, really challenging. Yeah. Um, I was I was back in Boston two weeks ago and I ran that segment. Strava told me for the 70th time. Nice. Um, so, and are you the king? Uh, definitely not the king. Yeah. No. 70 <laughs> over like a, an uh, eight year period. Sure, sure. Um, and it's wild because like I was, I don't know, like thousandth or something on the leaderboard. But um, it's such a, if if that were like a, a two and a half mile segment yeah. and that was the race, yeah. it would be so fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did, I did get to go last year. I think before we talked on the pod, I was there, um, did a little course preview and I, yeah, that part of the course is really cool. Um, and I don't, I, I remember after that being like, okay, it wasn't that bad. Like compared to the hills in Boulder, right. it's not that bad. Yeah. The first time I ran hills after being in Boulder for a long period of time, it was the Falmouth Road Race in the summer of 2021. Yeah. And there's a big climb after the first mile. You're along the coast. Have mm-hmm. you run? Yeah. You've run Falmouth, mm-hmm. yeah. 
um, and it's right near the lighthouse yeah. and you're arc, arcing up and then down and everyone's like, oh, there's a really big climb. It, I, it was either mile one or mile two. Yeah. And I motored up that climb. And I was like, whoa, hills are easy. Yeah. And, sea level. <laughs> yeah. and then that was my fastest mile. But <laughs> yeah, wow. um, but it's such a it's so fun to to get out there. And and the crowd is for anyone who's not spectated the Boston Marathon, like make a point to go do it because like she was saying, it doesn't matter if you're in first or fifth or 40,000th, like people are going to cheer you in. And the crowd of people that's going through at like three or four or 5 PM, there are still massive crowds out there for those people too. And it's it's super cool. Yeah. I did make it a point last year, instead of feeling sorry for myself for hours on end after the race to like go back out and watch some people finish and nothing like watching a marathon to like give you restored faith in humanity, period, no matter how you're feeling. Totally. So when you're approaching a course that you're not familiar with, um, there are a lot of it's kind of hard, right? When mm-hmm. you're approaching a course you are familiar with, you may have some some type of advantage. So how did your training look different last year compared to this year? Yeah, I think this year we definitely were more intentional about planning specific long run routes to mimic the course. So we did an okay job with that last year, but um, I feel like every year we add something in and get a little bit better with our training. So that was one thing we focused on this year was really hitting some downhills early in a long run and then try to hit some strong uphills, you know, around mile 17, 18 and a 20 mile long run to kind of simulate those hills and then finish with maybe one or two fast downhill miles again. And that takes some extra effort because I can't just, you know, most of my long runs are self-supported. So I'll do some like five, six mile loops from my car. But when you do something really intentional like that, you have to have somebody yeah. following you around in a car. So um, a couple of weeks ago, the two little ones and my husband, you know, sat in the car for two and a half hours and followed me around the back roads of Boulder and they were such troopers. But to be able to do something like that, you have to have somebody supporting you like that. So yeah, um, it's worth the extra effort, I hope. Because I feel much more confident now. We gotta get you out to the um, the Boulder Boulder 5K time trial yeah. with the the downhill oh, right. send from um, left hand. Yep, that's where we've been starting most of nice. our long runs. Yeah, 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 is that downhill, and then kind of trying to finish like on the lower part of that too. It's such an interesting feeling to be going hard downhill at altitude, where it's like yeah a long extended downhill. It's not that steep, but it's steep right. enough. Enough, yeah. It kind of like, I think it's important at altitude training to get in some of that race specific turnover too. So even if your race isn't particularly downhill, like we did this a lot for Chicago too, where you just got like that rhythm that you're going to be actually yeah. running because it's so hard to practice race pace With the, tur- the additional turnover of like a slight exactly. grade. Yeah. yeah. Before Boston 2021, I did my last effort. It was a 5K from South Boulder Creek down Bobo. Yeah. Down Bobo. Yeah. It's like flat enough right. but it's still 50 feet a mile and yeah. so you get some um benefit of additional turnover it yeah. felt like it was cheating but it was fun that's awesome that's a good one um what are you loving most about running right now i well like i said i've been trying to make an effort of meeting up with some people lately and so that's kind of reminded me that that's one of the things i've always loved about running is you know the quote unquote teammates your training partners just you know friends that you get to meet up with every couple of weeks um yeah i've been able to do that the last couple of weeks and i'm like oh yeah i really like runners also as well as running and like the social hour of it has been nice um and in the past i've been doing a ton of training with boulder underground and i feel like this build up um, we've been doing a nine day schedule so i just haven't been able to like sync up with them as much so i miss them but um yeah trying to be intentional about just meeting up with people i know and love um that's what i'm loving about running it was fun to do some miles with you last last winter with uh, or last yeah, I guess winter um, up at Mags and yeah. uh, and then decent bagel afterwards. <laughs> yes, the best part of running at Mags. <laughs> the best part of running yeah. at Mags is the more than decent bagel. Yeah. Um. So the community aspect. Yeah, for sure. So I had Dakota Lindworm on the podcast on Sunday. Awesome. And uh, she talked about the crowds and the people and the cheering. And she's like, my name is close enough to Dez's that people think that I'm Dez. So they cheer for me. And I really just want them to say like, you look strong. So if someone sees you out on the course on Marathon Monday, what do you want to hear? Um, 
I personally love like the ironic, totally wrong, like <laughs> make me there. giggle. Yeah. Like at 5k in be like, kick, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love those signs. Like, kick. I think I, maybe I mentioned this on the last podcast, but the, some of the signs I took in at CIM last, like two years ago were so funny. Like this lady had a sign that said worst parade ever. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Like she's out there cheering, but she's also making fun of us. Um, yeah. I like those. The signs in Wellesley will, will yeah. knock your socks off. Yeah. The signs in Wellesley are good. Like we, I definitely got asked to, you know, like kiss a few girls as I was running by, but I, I didn't, which was probably good. <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Didn't matter to them. No, it didn't. Um, <laughs> Okay. So let's, so we, I'm sure we'll get back to Boston, but, um, I'm super curious around something I've been struggling with a lot lately is balancing or balancing isn't the word, but fitting running in with a busy life. Mm -hmm. I don't have kids. You have several kids, Mm -hmm. um, but we both have a full-time job, um, a partner, all these things, a, a dog and things that we like to do outside of running as well. And, you're in real estate. It's a wild time to be in real estate, mm-hmm. I imagine. Um, so talk to me about the ebb and flow of like your peak, you're in peak training yeah. and maybe you have a lot of other things going on at the same time. How do you, how do you rectify all of that? Or how do you, how do you grapple with that? Yeah. So I've always hated that phrase balance. Like, I feel like it's such a cliche term used, um, especially when it comes to women, like trying to balance everything. Like you see it on all the women's magazines as headlines often. And I just, I don't buy into that. There's no such thing as balance. And that's basically what I tell people, right? Like I'm two weeks out from Boston and I'm going to be really honest. I am backing way off at work. Like that is bottom um, priority for me for the next two weeks. If a client needs something, of course I'm there. Got two closings like two days after I get back. Like I'm going to, of course, I'm not going to drop the ball on anything, but like I'm not prospecting for new clients. I'm not hosting open houses. I'm like bare minimum, you know, pushing that to the bottom and prioritizing running. And then as soon as it's over, that'll like totally flip around and switch back. So like, honestly, that's just it is that you can't do it all perfectly well all the time. You just have to um, pick and choose. And sometimes those change really, really quickly for me. And I mean, also to be super, super honest, the more deep I get into marathon training, this will be my fourth in like 16 months or something. Um, the harder it is to do, to, to do other things. Well, like I feel like the more invested I am into marathon training. Obviously it comes with like some physical fatigue, but the mental fatigue of it too. Like I'm just, I'm not working as much as I was a year and a half ago. I'm just not, it's too hard. What, what do the weeks and months look like after a marathon build? Well, usually because I kind of have this like mental shift focus on, on the marathon, usually after, um, especially if I have some like downtime away from running or just not putting in as many hours running, I'm like way back into real estate mode. And I just like dive in and actually have to go to a networking event like a couple of days after I get back from Boston. And so that'll kind of restart my um, real estate focus for the summer. Yeah. Cool. If you've been enjoying this podcast and can spare 90 seconds of your time today, can you do me a favor? Can you pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review? It helps other people find and enjoy the podcast too. Thanks so much. Thank you to Salt Stick for sponsoring this episode of For the Long Run Podcast. If you deal with muscle cramps, fatigue, or just general dehydration, check out Salt Stick's suite of products to help you replenish what you lose in your sweat during those long workouts on the road or on the trail. Whether you're a fan of capsules, powders, or chewables, you'll find awesome flavors and plenty of hydration with Salt Stick. And remember, friends who hydrate and replenish electrolytes stay together. And that's what this podcast is all about. We're stoked to be partnered with a company that's backed by science and helps us stay hydrated and healthy for the long run. So head on over to A-L-E-T-E nutrition.com to check them out and use code FTLR for 20% off your first order. Thanks again to Salt Stick for supporting the show. This episode of For the Long Run podcast is sponsored by Puma. For 75 years, Puma has been pushing sports and culture forward with innovative design and development. We are honored to have Puma supporting this show and supporting the running community at large. My greatest compliment for running shoe is, I didn't think about it once. The purpose of having the right gear is to enable you to do anything you want out there. When I'm running in Puma's Deviate Nitro first mile, all I'm thinking about is literally anything else. I think about the community. I think about why trying hard things is so rewarding. Think about how cute Alfie is. 
and I think about how much I love tacos, and I think about the big things like how I want to leave each place I inhabit better than I found it. You know what I'm not thinking about? What's on my feet? And that's the best thing about Puma running shoes. They're designed to help you get out there effortlessly so you don't have to worry about what's on your feet. Just need to worry about putting one foot in front of the other. Check out a pair for yourself at puma.com and use the code for the long run, all one word, for 20% off. Again, when you support Puma, you're supporting me and the rest of the podcast team. Thanks again to Puma for supporting us. Is it a good market to buy a home in? What about to sell a home? What even goes on in the housing market? How do you even keep track? Well, good news for you. You don't have to know all the answers if you're interested in buying or selling your home because you can just work with the best realtor around, Lauren Daniels. Whether you're thinking of buying or selling your home, Lauren is your go-to. She treats every client with care and helps make what could be a very scary process, dare I say, fun. Lauren helps you get organized and stay on top of important deadlines and guides you towards the right home for you instead of pushing you towards something that doesn't feel right. Even if you're not ready yet or you're not in the Denver or Boulder area, we highly recommend following Lauren on Instagram because she's always sharing great information about the housing market. Give her a follow at lauren.in.colorado on Instagram. And if you're already ready to start the conversation, give her a shout at ldaniels at milehighmodern.com and let her know we sent you. That's ldaniels at milehighmodern.com. Um, so this podcast is brought to you by another real estate yeah. <laughs> realtor, yeah. uh, speedy realtor, Lauren Daniels. Um, you've done some sponsoring of your own with, yeah. uh, is it a foundation? Yeah. Well, we, um, I, we just started a nonprofit mm-hmm. and then, yeah, I've done some other sponsoring for like some local road races. Yeah. It's or been cool to races. see that. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about that. What is it like to be at a place where you can start giving back in that, in that yeah. way? I love it. I am a big believer in putting your money where your mouth is. And I you know, didn't have a sponsor for so long. And for several years before I got into real estate, just wanted to make running work so badly as far as, you know, making a living. And there just weren't a ton of opportunities. I posted something yesterday, I think that only 1% of sponsorship dollars in sports are even going to women. Um, but running is, is <laughs> it's got its own problems yeah. though, you know, like there's just, there aren't a lot of sponsorship dollars to go around. So I am so happy to like write those checks. Like nothing makes me happier and it's super fulfilling. And um, yeah, just to give back to my running community, especially in Boulder where, you know, I wouldn't always be able to travel for races or, you know, get invited to these big meets. And they're like really competitive opportunities here all the time. Yeah. Talk to me more about the actual like sponsorship of these races and, and things. Yeah. Um, I got to a place where I was able to start doing something similar. I sponsored some race coverage in January and it was like, it was so cool to see the podcast logo on a broadcast in front of thousands of people. And I'm in a similar position where like running is not my full-time job. I make money outside of running. And so I can yeah. use the money I make in running in a totally different way yeah. um, to repeat that cycle and, and reinvest it back into the community. I'm curious um, how long have you wanted to do something like that? Where did, where did sort of the, the idea come from and what has it led to? Well, the general idea um, for me personally is just tithing. So I've always believed in giving a portion of my income um, away and not just randomly putting it in a, in a bucket. Um, but I've always wanted to be a little more, um, like I kind of wanted to track where that goes or um, I don't know, have a little more control over it, which maybe I need to work on letting that go too. But it started- no, it's your money. It's, you can put yeah. it where you want. Right. But you know, like just having a giving heart is where that came yeah. from. And so it started with a sponsorship or a scholarship rather, um, an endowment at CU Boulder. So that's been going for six years now. Um, and that's self-sufficient now. We've given enough money that that's in the general student fund and it it's invested and it makes its own money and it'll help people forever. So once we got to that point um, at CU, that's when I really wanted to deviate and finally start the foundation, which has been on my mind since I had a child um, in college. My phone's ringing, so it's probably her because um, I have it on Do Not Disturb. 
Um, anyway, so yeah, so great time. <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we started the foundation. I had been thinking about it and talking about it and feeling called to do it forever. And I just finally had to jump in and do it. I didn't really feel like I knew what I was doing and it hasn't come without its hiccups. I mean, just this morning I was dealing with something like we wrote, we got to write some checks. We have some applicants and they're getting awarded money. And because we're so new and my bank account is so new that like it had a transaction limit. So a couple of checks were trying to get cashed and like we had the money, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't cash their checks because they're like, whoa, you're over your transaction yeah. limit for the week or whatever. I was like, oh geez. So it's not without its hiccups. I definitely still am learning a ton, but um, being able to write those checks is so, so exciting because I was there. I was in college with a kid, not knowing how I was going to make it work. And like a couple thousand dollars would have been life-changing. And so to have the ability to do that now and like give somebody some peace of mind um, so they can focus on graduating and running, like, I don't know, that means the world to me. If someone's listening, they're like, whoa, that's awesome. I want to be a part of this. What's the call to action? Um, it's vonchildcarefund.org. There's donation buttons on every page. Cool. And, and suggested amounts too. So we kind of base it off of average childcare um, prices around the country. So you can kind of donate a day or a week or a month, however you want to do it. Very cool. So talk to me about becoming a sponsored runner and having the challenges of the financial aspect of traveling to races and, mm -hmm. and all of this um, sort of loosened. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't think I ever really functioned fully like to my ability or my potential when I had our like, uh, livelihood based on my performances, if that makes sense. Like I never did well that way. Um, so I did have to get to a point where, you know, I was doing well enough in real estate that I could really separate the two and, go figure ironically <laughs> like when i finally feel like i'm self sufficient and like on my own two feet <laughs> financially <laughs> yeah i'm like oh yeah here's here's some money for you to keep running i'm like oh, okay cool like i'm so grateful for it it's it was such it is such a cool thing um but i didn't like run a marathon for that reason at all <laughs> and so i was like it was like a bonus um it's it's been really cool and more than that like i feel like a professional like i love having matching kits. And I love kind of having like, you know, built in teammates and this whole corporation that's like excited about what I'm doing. That's really fun. What's the, what's the Boulder Puma crew like? Yeah. The Boulder Puma crew is cool. Yeah. Um, Aisha, I, when I first signed with Puma at the beginning of last year, we were doing a photo shoot to announce it and I, um, my gear got lost. So I had like no Puma gear for this photo shoot to announce. And I so I, I was like calling Aisha <laughs> for like, like some gear, but yeah, no, it's, it's great. Like the whole Puma fam is great. Um, but yeah, I feel very spoiled. I got connected with Puma earlier this year and they're like, we, we love the sport. We're making big investments in the sport. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier, like, people putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah. Um, the people that I've interacted with, mostly Greg and um, Luke, yeah. have been just like really fun humans to yeah. know in addition to like what they do for work. So Greg was our college teammate too. So oh, that's cool. been super fun for me <laughs> in particular. Um, Greg was like a really close friend of ours when um, when Brent and I were in college. We lived right over here in those blue apartments like uh, across- Right across foothills. Yeah. And Greg lived in the building um, across the street from us. And I was super pregnant one summer and didn't have air conditioning and Greg did. So he gave me a key to his apartment and he would come home from class and I would just be like sleeping on his couch. <laughs> in the air conditioning. But yeah, but now I think it's so cool that he's the guy I get a call if I'm like, I need shoes or like whatever it is. That's awesome. Yeah. So will you be at the events yeah. Saturday, Sunday? Mm -hmm. I will. What are the details? Well, not Sunday. I won't be, Got I won't be there. You're busy Sunday. Sunday. They give us the day off on cool. Sunday because I have stuff Friday and Saturday. That's where Laura Green gets to tell people nobody cares. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just go home. Um, Saturday, I don't know what the details are. I'd have, I'd have to look. I don't have anything memorized. I can't think that far ahead. 2 p.m. Marathon Sports. Thank you. Sorry. 2 p.m. It's going to be in the show notes. Um, I believe it's 2 p.m. at the Fiedler Field. Okay on the Esplanade. And then Sunday is marathon sports with a run to the Sitco sign and back. So like cool. three ish miles, a uh, bunch of awesome Puma athletes, a um, bunch of giveaways yeah. and swag and all that fun stuff. And then we'll have a zone at 24.2 right. um, where I will almost unironically say you're almost there. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So you, 
you're standing on the start line of Boston for your second round at Boston. You've just made it through a second go around of training for it. Um, you've done a bunch of these fun events and it's 47 degrees and partly cloudy. It's a perfect day. Let's not visualize a perfect day. <laughs> Either way, what, right, are you, right. what are you thinking about on that start line? One of the things I've learned about marathons is that that's my favorite moment is to look back at everybody else who's about to start behind us because it kind of gives you this sense of camaraderie that you're like all about to go into battle together, <laughs> you know? So that's what I think about. Last year, I was thinking about how miserable I felt and like kind of panicking and I was super distracted on the starting line and I feel kind of sad about it because I didn't really get to have that moment. Um, I was just like skill spiraling a little bit. <laughs> so this year, I'm going to be really intentional about like taking it in. I mean, it's such a historic start line just to enjoy the moment. Is gratitude a component of your day to day? Definitely. I mean, that's how I try to live my life in general. Like I try to reframe everything um, as a blessing or somehow working out for my good. Yeah. How do you do that when it's like, well, but why is it this hard? I mean, a life, you can't avoid, you know, pain or difficulties in life, right? Those are unavoidable. Um, so it's just figuring out how to react in those and and deal with it, you know? I don't know why last year went so poorly, for example, but at least I got a course preview. I finished <laughs> really slowly, so I got to take it all in a little better, you know? And I don't, I don't know why, but maybe I'm more prepared this year, Um in general, sometimes we can't like rationalize things about life, but we can control, you know, how we think about them, how we frame them. Yeah. One of the topics that I've become particularly fascinated with talking about or asking about over the last year or two is defining success and the ways that people do that. So yeah. um, before I wax poetic on that, how do you define success? Yeah. We talked about this last year, I remember, and it kind of got me thinking about it again. Um, I mean, I love goal setting, but I also love process oriented goals. And I don't know. I mean, last year, like I keep going back to this race last year, but it wasn't a complete failure. Like I had an amazing buildup. I built fitness. I, you know, got to experience things and I don't know. I just, I hope to move that all forward. And there will be a day where I'll stop PRing, I guess, probably sometime in the future. <laughs> and so like, for, that so, yeah, <laughs> so for so long, I just, you know, that's how I kept being like, that's, I'm going to keep coming back for more because I keep PRing and something. And I know I can't define success that way always, but you know, that's the black and white of it is like, I want to PR in two weeks that'll be a successful day no matter what else happens. Um, but maybe the weather's terrible and maybe that's not, a, maybe that doesn't make sense anymore. So I don't know. I mean, I think effort and attitude and how you can control those are a huge way of how I would define success. So let's say you don't PR, but you still call the day a success. What would you have done? Um, yeah, control what I can control. And like I said, effort, effort and attitude, that's all, you know, like if it's one of those days where times don't matter, like how am I going to push myself and pay attention to my sensory data and know that I'm working hard and racing hard and um, just trying to get the best out of myself on that day. Okay. So let's do some more visualization. So you've come down the first steep 5k, you've gone through Natick, you're coming into Wellesley scream tunnel. Mm -hmm. You hear it from a half mile away. Yeah. You go, you start making your way into Newton, you pass the Whole Foods, you hit the fire station, you turn right, yep. you're on Calm Ave. There's a big hill. Mm -hmm. What's in your head right there? Mm, I hope I'm chomping at the bit. I hope I have my legs under me and I'm just like ready to let it rip at that point. Yeah. I did a course preview of um, Boston a while ago, and I vividly remember what I said to the GoPro as I made that turn. Yeah. I said, you've trained all winter for this turn. Oh, I watched that course preview. <laughs> I think you sent that to me. Yes. Right? I love, yeah, yeah. I love that turn because that's like mile 17 and a half, yeah. almost 18. And I think that's where the the racing starts. That's where the fun starts. And that's where you know if you know it's gonna be a, a wonderful day or a really hard day where you still get to do challenging things. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. No, that turn um is a big like a big turning point in the in the 
race itself. It's one of right? a few turning points. Exactly. In the <laughs> exactly. But it's like, if you can get there and feel good, then you can like let go of the reins, you know, and just air it out a little bit. So I feel that that approach is really simplifying it in a good way, right? Like yeah. it's about chunking. It's about yeah. like break it up in the ways that I, I just did. Yeah. So it's Natick, Wellesley, Newton, Hills, yep. Brookline finish. Yep. And ma- many of us have run 18 miles many, many times and we can run 18 miles many, many times. I ran 18 miles last weekend without planning it. And <laughs> I was like, this is great. It was all in the, the marathon course. And I, I just love the framing of like, just get to that turn yeah. and then see what you're made of. Yeah. And yeah. Kipchoge is just up the road. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no human is limited at that point. Right. Oh man, that's going to be wild. The crowds are going to be extra amped. Yeah. It's going to be so cool to see him coming through. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to what you were saying earlier about um, being a sponsored athlete. You're now a couple of years into that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of dialogue lately on Twitter, on Instagram, et cetera, about like performance versus storytelling. Mm -hmm. I feel like you do both very well. Thank you. Um, And I'm curious if that's intentional. I mean, obviously the performance aspect is a little less controllable, Um, but I'm curious your your focus around social media and um, what you're being asked to do and what you like to do. Yeah. So, but for a long time before I was sponsored, I thought that that was the key to get a sponsorship was to build a bigger social media base. Like maybe that was a piece of the puzzle that I was lacking or whatever. And so to make myself more marketable, I kind of leaned into that a bit, but um, never really strayed too far from like what I enjoy posting and talking about. And then, you know, as far as like my obligations for Puma, I don't really have much. Um, They really wanted me to continue with my own voice and kind of just come alongside and support that. Um, So I feel like really blessed in that way that like they don't require me to do a bunch of cheesy posts and like scripted stuff, um, which is really nice. But from all those years of like kind of leaning into social media, I feel like I've built a little bit of a community online and I really enjoy connecting with other mom runners around the country. One of my favorite things I've done was that video with Laura, like that parody that we did. Um, cause it was like this, I, I got to have a little bit of a creative outlet. Like I, I shot her, I don't remember exactly how it transpired, but I shot her an email, like kind of being like, we should do this. And she was like, okay. And she sent me a script like the next day. And then I sent her something back that was like a little, like it was mostly what she had written, but we added a lot and I don't, it was just so fun. Like it was just silly and fun. She brings so much to the, to the running community. She really does. I was in a meeting with Puma a few weeks ago and one of them asked me, they were like, oh, would you be cool with like a, a co-host for these events? She has quite a different platform and audience than you. And I was like, yeah. is it Laura Green? <laughs> and his it. face turned bright red. And um, <laughs> it was like, I can't tell you. Aww. And I was like, I'm going to text her. So. I'm going to text her right now. So I texted her and she's like, uh, who's asking? I was like, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, are you working with Puma? Anyway, um, the it's such like a... I've known Laura for, I don't know, 10 years now okay. through November Project. And like, what's cool about her is that she's not changed at all. Mm-hmm. Her her shtick is like, running is stupid. And I like, right. I mm-hmm. like it. Right. And we all love it. <laughs> and we all love yeah. it. And some people I feel like get Insta famous and like yeah. change yeah. entirely. She's like doubled down yeah. on running is stupid and we, and we like it yeah. and it's so refreshing. And so like, I mean, I wish everyone could listen to her advice prior to a marathon because it's so true. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely, I enjoy her attitude. I mean, she's all of us, right? Like she expresses things that you're like, oh, I thought that to myself, <laughs> but I never would make a video <laughs> about it. So thank you, Laura. Like she's so, I love it. Um, but yeah, like definitely taking that attitude forward too. Like I, I don't really have anything to lose. Like. I don't have anything to lose. I mean, it's silly. So why not just go for it? Do you think that there's some like intentionality around that? Like I'm seeing a lot. Uh, so I just spoke with Dakota Linworm and she said the same thing. She's like, I have a job and it allows me to not pay my bills by race performance. Mm-hmm. And that enables me to perform. Totally. totally. And so I'm curious if there's like some intentionality around choosing athletes related to like 
we know that they're going to perform and we know that they're going to be good humans. Maybe that's a question for our friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, yeah, that's a good question. I think like a consistency for me only ever started after I was like financially stable. So I always had a really hard time with that. I think partly because, you know, we always had a kid to take care of too. So the stakes were a little higher. Um, but. And that's where the foundation comes in, right? Like you're totally. trying to alleviate that struggle for totally. other people. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's such a stress, especially as a college kid, you know, it's such a stress. Like you can't, if you're a college athlete, like taking a job also, um, just is impossible. I mean, it's, it was so hard. I, I tutored, I like did some high school tutoring for a sweet family that I'm still in touch with here in Boulder. Um, but like I couldn't do much, you know, it was like a hundred bucks every couple of weeks or something. So yeah. Anyway, it's, it's a really cool thing, but that to your point, like alleviating that for someone so that they can focus on, on just like relaxing into their races is a huge, huge deal. So what's the takeaway for an amateur there? I mean, I think that for an amateur there, I don't, I don't really like the, like amateur pro, like why, like there, there's no line that you cross where you're one or the other really anymore. Um, but I think that like, if you have a full-time job, but you still have this huge passion or, um, dreams or goals for yourself, like you can approach it just like a pro would. Like there's really no difference. You're going to check the box at work. You have your financial freedom. You get to pay your bills. That's a blessing. Like that's huge. Um, so why not take that attitude of like, I get to do this. Like I've, I work hard in my office job so that I can go run in circles on the weekends. The I get to do this part is like a good check-in with yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel, yeah. um, if you're ever at a place where like, and speaking from experience over the last few weeks, like I was at a place where I was like, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than, oh, I've got to, I have to go for a run. Like I actually didn't want to. Right. <laughs> and to me, that was a trigger. That was a flag to yeah. like, look at that further. And, um, but that, that assessment of using, I get to do this. Oh, it's snowing. Oh, it's raining. Oh, right. it's cold. Well, you still get to do this. And again, nobody is making you, even as a, someone who's paid to run, nobody is making you go out for that run. Right. Um, yeah. Maybe your coach. I don't know. No. Since you're in the same house, but nah. if I didn't go for my run, I mean, he'd check in, he'd be like, are you okay? But no, he's not kicking me out the door. Like it has to come from yourself and you have to want it. That's always kind of been my, like, um, I've kept an eye out for that red flag because to me, that's always been like, well, maybe I'll walk away from the sport or retire or whatever you want to call it. Um, when I have that feeling like consistently, but I haven't. But have you had it in like a, a lighter period maybe? Totally. Or like a day to day thing. Sure. But if I have it, um, at a race, like to me, um, uh, several of my competitors that I raced against the last decade have retired. And that sounds to me like what they are experiencing. Like I remember one woman who's just like, I don't want to be at these races anymore. I, I, I wouldn't be sad if I had missed this. Yeah. And to me, I'm always sad if I'm not on the start line. I'm like, man, like even when I'm training for a marathon, I'm like, Oh, that mile looked really fun. You know, I always want that. So that, that hasn't kicked in for me yet. Um, but to me like, and it will, and there's no shame in that, but yeah, for now that's not there. You said something earlier that I want to bring back up and sort of build on this. You said that eventually you'll stop PRing um, and the measures of success and growth will change to something else. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked a lot with a lot of people who are like, I want to run for the next 50 years, et cetera. Let's say you fast forward 25 years and you've stopped PRing yeah. in the marathon. Fair enough. So let's say, yeah. I yeah. think that's a safe yeah. Yeah. <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Um, What's, what's bringing you joy related to running? I don't know. That's a super interesting question because I don't know that, um, I don't know that I'm like fully, fully in love with the day to day grind of, of training and just like miles. I love workouts. I love racing. And that's kind of what gets me through like a lot of training blocks. But I think someday when I walk away from competition, I don't know that I'll run every day. I think I'll you know, do something else. I don't know. Peloton. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, who knows? Pilates. Like, I don't, I don't know. So I don't really have an answer. I know it'll be something physical where I push my body in some way. Um, 
Maybe it would be a long backpacker. Yeah. I mean, actually, I hate hiking. I like that. Okay, maybe not. No, not that. But maybe like rock climbing yeah. or something else extreme. Or um, I was telling a friend last week that I thought I wanted to be a triathlete or um, a cyclist for like a minute in That's high school. That's because you live in Boulder. Yeah. Well, but then I, no, I was in high school and I lived oh. in Nebraska and I bought a really nice road bike and then I wrecked it like two days <laughs> later and I was like, I'm never touching a road bike again. So that won't be it, but so it'll be something. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I could go for hours with these, these silly questions. Um, but I think I have one more. So last year, Kara tuned in to the podcast to use for show notes for the broadcast. Yeah. Let's say she's listening again for the same purpose. What do you want her or someone who's watching you on, on Marathon Monday to, to know about you? Hmm, That's a really good question. Um, well, I'd want Kara to know in particular <laughs> that because I, I got to um, experience training with Kara when we both lived in Portland. We overlapped for a couple of years and I really got to see her work herself back and, um, you know, into marathon shape and like watching her and Shalane train for the trials in 2012. I've never seen women work so hard. Like I didn't know that was possible. So that was really inspiring. So in general, I would just want people to know that like, that that's what I'm doing. I'm pushing my limits. I'm really, really trying to see how hard I can train without tipping over the edge, which is such a delicate balance. But, um, you know, I'd say I'm more all in now than I was a year ago. And I'm just excited to see how that plays out. And that no matter how it plays out, my kids are going to be at the finish line and they're not going to care. And they're going to want to go get a hot dog at Fenway. And you know, that's all. Amazing. I love it. Uh, We'll see you out there. See you at 24.2 and all the other fun places. And uh, uh, it's time to kick. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next time on for the long run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too. This podcast and the accompanying music has been produced by Brian Walters of Single Track Sound. For the Long Run's logo is created by Vanessa Wolf of Sterling Wolf. Show notes have been written by Ruby Wiles and is managed by Emily Holland. It takes a village. 